Hi there, folks. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, my name is Ken LePage, and I'm the sales manager here at MagTech. Uh, first and foremost, we hope everyone is healthy and safe during this coronavirus pandemic. Our thoughts, prayers, and well wishes go out to all that have been affected by this horrible virus. Today, we're going to formally introduce to you our new shock series of loggers. Uh, in the coming weeks, we're going to have other web training sessions on other newly released loggers, like the X series, the EX series, and the LCS 140. It is also our plan that anytime that we get ready to release a new logger, we'll have a webinar specifically for our distribution teams so we can introduce the new products to them, uh, give them the features and benefits of those loggers, the marketing materials, the pricing information, uh, so they're ready to hit the ground running with the new products as they're released. Uh, we'll have time for questions and answers at the end of this training. Uh, so send your questions in as you think of them and we'll answer them for you. I said we, because joining me today is Thomas King, our technical support manager. And he'll be presenting most of the information to you today. And also with us is our marketing manager, Meredith Orbach, and she'll be uh, reading your questions to us to answer at the end. So without further ado, here we are, uh, Thomas and myself, and I'm gonna hand it off to Thomas right now. Thanks, Ken, and uh, thank you, Meredith, for getting this set up and running the show. Uh, as Ken said, my name is Thomas King. I'm the technical support manager here at MagTech, and I've been here for close to nine years. Uh, we get to talk to a lot of customers in unique and in interesting applications, so I'm never bored. Uh, the world is certainly going through some strange times, like Ken said, so we hope that everyone is safe and healthy, and we're happy that we can continue to operate and that we have the chance to still reach out to you all like we're doing here today. The product that we're going to be discussing today are the new UltraShock and the Shock 300. We'll focus primarily on the UltraShock as this one will support all of the features, functionality, and parameters that we'll discuss. But we'll touch on the Shock 300 as well for those users that do not have a need for the additional temperature, pressure, and humidity monitoring and only need to focus on the triaxial shock recording. So this is an incredibly versatile and adaptable model. Later in the talk, we'll get into how it can be customized and adapted based on the user's requirements. But first, we'll talk about what applications or industries have needs for these types of devices. Um, so looking at the applications, the most common applications for these models are in the shipping and transportation industries. Now, this logger is suitable for all types of shipping and really every facet of the application. So this includes shipping by land, air, and sea, and it includes monitoring the products themselves, the packaging of the products or devices being shipped, the loading or unloading or transitions between different methods of transportation, uh, to monitoring the vessels or the vehicles themselves. So to give you a few examples, uh, some users might be tracking the transportation of very, very sensitive pieces of equipment, such as a precision microscope or something along those lines. So they may use the shock logger to mount it directly to the device that's being monitored to make sure that it doesn't experience any undue shock so it's damaged. Uh, another application where you might be monitoring a specific device would be something like a, a transformer. Um, a transformer can be a very large and expensive piece of equipment. Uh, and this might be traveling one state over or traveling from one country to another, uh, you know, going across the European Union. So our device allows you to ensure that the product that's being uh, transported is not going to exceed any kind of safety or tolerances that might cause it to get damaged during shipment. Uh, like I said, you can also use it to track how effective packaging is in transportation. So depending on what's being shipped, it might be packaged in a cardboard box or a crate, or it might have some kind of uh, safety harness or shock absorbing system to ensure that it's not experiencing too much shock. Our device can be used to track and monitor the efficacy of these types of systems. Uh, in addition, you might want to track the vessels or the vehicles that are being used for transportation. So this can include 
you know, trucks, cargo trucks, 18 wheelers, um, large sea vessels, um, planes, you name it. And this kind of leads into some of our other applications like the automotive and aerospace industries. So as I said, the vehicles themselves might be monitored while they're in transportation, but in these industries, we are also a great product. Uh, we are also uh, putting out a great product for research and development. Uh, they can put shock loggers all over these vehicles to determine whether parts of the vehicles are shaking or seeing undue shock or vibration. Um, to test the safety tolerance or the failure tolerance of these components. Uh, it can also be used for crash testing. So you can uh, track to see whether the crash mitigation systems are being effective. For example, the crumple zones and the bumper, uh, whether or not they're properly slowing down the vehicle or even mounting uh, data loggers to a crash test dummy to ensure that uh, someone piloting or uh, acting as a passenger in one of these vehicles would not experience injury, harm, or even death uh, if it were to crash. Uh, brake testing is also a, another great way to use these loggers as you can track the deceleration or the negative acceleration of a vehicle as it slows down from the brakes. Um, in aerospace, again, it's going to be uh, mounting these devices on different parts of the aircraft to track vibration, to test to make sure everything is in its proper tolerance. Um, it can also be used to track turbulence on individual flights um, or to see how a specific aircraft handles turbulence. Uh, I'll turn it back over to Ken to, to talk about assembly line monitoring mm -hmm. some of the other applications. Right. So uh, in the manufacturing process, when a product is manufactured, it has to go through various forms of testing, uh, drop testing, fragility testing, to see how stable that product is and how much uh, force and shock it can be subjected to uh, once it's released into production. I know uh, from my manufacturing background, we used to have to do drop testing. It had to pass a certain amount of Gs so many times in each of the three axes. So we could understand <clears throat> what our products uh, would be able to stand up to when they're out in the field. So, you know, to put our shock logger on one of these drop tests to actually verify that the products are seeing the correct amount of G-forces uh, when they're tested in, in manufacturing is a, is a huge benefit to manufacturing engineers. Uh, assembly line monitoring, I, I think of circuit boards when parts are, you know, surface mounted parts are picked in place and put on that circuit board. They haven't been soldered yet. If they're subjected to vibration or minimal shocks, it's going to uh, knock those little components off of the pads that they're to be soldered to. And, you know, things will fail when it's going through testing. So, again, other little niche applications within the manufacturing process. Another really cool one is uh, orientation monitoring. So we've all seen packages that have this end up on the box. And we also understand that our friends in the shipping industry um, are not always very friendly to uh, packages as they're going across country. Uh, so by orientating the shock logger into the box a certain way, you can actually tell from the data once you download it, if that box had remained in a certain position with this end up for the entire trip that it was on. Tom, you want to uh, pop up last one? Absolutely, Ken. Uh, so another couple of industries where this can be very useful um, are tracking heavy machinery um, and the construction industry. So this is, again, uh, another industry where it could be used in several different facets of the application. So you might be monitoring the machinery itself. Um, so for construction, you'd be putting this on the back hose and bulldozers and cranes to make sure that those parts or, or those large pieces of equipment are not going to be damaged um, or they're not shaking or vibrating too much. Um, and in construction, you may also be monitoring uh, the environment around where this construction is happening. So for example, uh, if you're in a tight city and you've got a new building going up across the street, 
And every time they lay a new giant steel girder, you feel your building shake. You might put up a shock logger to see how much is your building shaking and is that going to be a problem? Um, or on the other end of the spectrum, uh, when a building needs to be taken down uh, or demolished, that demolition process uh, has to be done with surgical precision in the middle of a, a densely populated city to make sure that residents or other businesses are not affected by that demolition. Uh, so when you're taking down a, a, a skyscraper, uh, I think uh, some of you may have seen videos of this. It's pretty impressive. They, they do it right in the middle of all the other buildings, but they need to track to make sure that no damage is occurring to those other buildings uh, or if some, some damage were to occur to make sure that that's checked out. So our shock loggers could be mounted on all of the sensitive equipment, buildings, or, or other aspects of the environment around uh, the demolition project to ensure none of it is damaged. And one of the other uh, cool applications within that heavy machinery is driver ergonomics. Uh, so you, know, you could put the shock logger onto a driver's chair to see what kind of shocks and vibrations that that actual individual is seeing during a work day. Uh, you know, it helps design new chairs, seats for the driver, uh, and also could help if there was a, an injury on the job uh, that you could actually see what that, that driver went through. One of the coolest things about working here at MagTech is getting to talk to uh, several people out in the field that have some really, really cool applications. Uh, so for me, the shock logger is one of the cool ones. And my coolest application so far with this logger has been uh, having the logger placed onto a target within the ocean and monitoring the vibrations. So a sonar operator could actually track this target through the water. So really, really cool application. Uh, and I know Tom's got a couple as, as well that you may want to share with us. Yeah, Ken, like I said, that, that one right there is a very cool application. Um, and uh, we always enjoy hearing what our customers are doing with these loggers. Uh, like I said at the beginning, we're, we're never bored around here. Um, one of the most interesting applications I saw for a shock logger, uh, it's admittedly not common, so I didn't put it on the PowerPoint here, but I found it uh, fascinating was a user that was trying to improve or perfect football helmets. Um, in the US, uh, CTE um, or brain damage from football or other sports is a, a serious concern. So it's something a lot of people are looking into to see how can uh, we mitigate or, or reduce these types of injuries. So this uh, particular user was putting a shock logger in a football helmet and then subjecting the football helmet to various bumps, drops, crashes, et cetera, um, to see how much shock would be experienced by the head in that helmet. And then adjusting and improving the materials of that helmet to you know, make a, a more uh, effective and safer helmet for the players. And I, I thought that was pretty cool. That is a really, really cool application. All right, so uh, before we talk about the new ones, I do want to take just a few quick minutes to discuss the units that we've already have, uh, particularly for some of our longtime users or distributors that might be on the call. So previously, we had six main models, the Shock 101, the TSR 101, and the UltraShock, and each of these had an EB model as well. Now, the EB was an extended battery model. Um, otherwise, it had the same features and functionality, uh, but had a significantly larger form factor and it was quite a bit heavier. Um, so the Shock 101 was our standard triaxial peak shock recorder. So by triaxial, that just means three axes, X, Y, and Z. So you can track what direction or what orientation of the unit's in uh, and the direction of any shock or acceleration. Now, peak is kind of a, a cool thing that our loggers do that not every logger on the market can do. And that is uh, that it samples in the background, regardless of the reading interval that the user chooses, um, to make sure that you're catching the 
highest or largest shock or acceleration events. So for example, if you were to pick a one second reading interval, the peak shock recording means it's going to sample 512 times a second. So it'll take 512 samples and whatever the largest sample is, it will be pl placed into the buffer and recorded at that one second interval. The next set of models was the TSR models. So that, standard, uh, that stands for transient shock recorder. And this one would use instantaneous recording rather than the peak recording. So it only records at the instant that it takes a reading, but it allowed for even faster reading intervals. It could go up to uh, 1024 Hertz for a reading interval. So uh, incredibly fast recording. Now, because it was so fast, uh, you can imagine that you'd go through memory rather quickly. So the TSR had a nice feature where it had user defined trigger settings so that the user could determine what shock level or G-force level they wanted the unit to start recording at um, and basically eliminate any data where the, the logger was not moving or not being subjected to forces that were relevant. Now the Ultrashock, Ultrashock took everything from the Shock 101, so the triaxial peak shock recording, that 512 hertz sampling on the shock channels, and it added in temperature, humidity, and pressure. So this basically uh, made the logger even more suitable for uh, transportation and shipping applications where you might also want to track these additional parameters like temperature and humidity or pressure to determine altitude, for example, uh, throughout the course of a shipment. Um, so now we've got just two shock models. So we went from six and we are down to two, but we are maintaining all of the functionality that we had from the prior six, which is a, a great deal for users and it makes it much easier for our, our distributors as well. Um, so the ultra shock, again, it's triaxial peak shock recording, but it does temperature, humidity, and pressure recording. And then the shock 300, uh, which we've recently introduced is for those users who are looking for a little bit lower cost option that may not need the additional temperature, humidity, and pressure recording. Uh, if you're unsure, my recommendation would typically go with the Ultrashock because we'll talk about how configurable and adaptable these units are. And you can always customize it for any given application and leave yourself uh, open the possibility of changing those settings for another run or another recording. Now, the, the last thing that we'll talk about about the differences between the old series and the new series before we talk about some specific features and functionality are the acceleration ranges or the, the G-force ranges. So with the prior units, this was a decision that you had to make before you bought the unit. We had loggers that were available in four different ranges previously, 5G, 50G, 100G, and 250G. Um, so I said we had six units before, but the reality was it was basically 24 uh, if you needed one for, you know, various applications and various ranges. Now we've got three ranges, but we're covering the same uh, scope, if you will, because we're going all the way up to 300G instead of a maximum of 250G with the prior uh, series and our 15G despite being three times as large as the, the 5G range was previously, has uh, approximately the same accuracy and resolution. So the best part about this, however, is you do not have to pick the range before you buy the unit. Um, these are built in in the new models. So you only have to select the range when you configure the logger to start a recording. Um, there are two sets of accelerometers in these units. There's a high G and a low G set of accelerometers. So the low G covers the 15 G range and the high G covers the 100 and 300 G ranges. Um, and this allows you to tailor the device for each and every recording uh, for whatever range you require. Uh, so as I said, that, that basically brought us down from 24 separate types of units down to one if you go with the new ultra shock or two if you're looking additionally at the the shock 300 
So now let's talk about some of the individual feature improvements. So first, uh, it looks a whole lot different because we've got an all new design and form factor. It's smaller and more compact than um, the basic shock 101 was before. It's significantly smaller than the ultra shock. It's also lighter than both units, again, significantly lighter than uh, the, the EB units were before. We've also got a new through hole mounting design. So before you had flanges coming off of the side of the device, uh, the through hole design allows us to keep, you know, a, a much smaller, more subtle form factor. And, you know, it's just a more attractive modern design. Also on the design or visual front is we now have LED status indicators. Uh, before the older devices had no indication on the outside of what they were doing or what mode they were in. Now you've got status indicators to tell you when the device is charging, uh, the level of charge, whether it's running or whether it's waiting to start. Um, so this is very helpful for the user to get information at a glance without plugging the device in. Now we've also added some additional key features and functionality. Uh, one of the big ones is improved battery life. So with the prior models, we had about a seven day battery life on the normal smaller units and up to 30 days on the giant EB models. With this device, uh, it's very customizable. So depending on how you configure the channels, the reading interval, or whether you're doing peak or instantaneous, um, it can be up to 90 days. Uh, if you've got all the bells and whistles turned on, um, you've got all six channels running and you're running uh, peak mode, so you've got this 512 hertz sampling rate, then typically you'd be looking at you know 25 to 30 days, which is equivalent to those EB models, but way better than uh, the regular Shock 101. And again, in, in this new smaller form factor. Even better, uh, the device is rechargeable. So before where you had to change batteries before every run, which could get uh, not only expensive, but it was also kind of tedious to need to do that maintenance each time. This one's rechargeable. Uh, it's actually one of the few Magitech devices that does have uh, rechargeable functionality. So we're very excited to, to offer that in the new device. And it's being recharged over USB-C. So you can see in the image here, we've got a USB-C connection. This is the most modern USB port type. So I'm sure uh, many of you are seeing this on a lot of your newer devices, uh, cell phones and other electronics. Uh, it's becoming very common and uh, we expect it to be the new standard for quite some time. Um, that USB-C port gives us another great advantage. So whereas most of our devices, including the old shock loggers required an interface, this device actually has the interface built in. You just plug it in through the USB-C connection to your computer to communicate with our Magitech software. No additional interface is required. And the USB-C, in addition to recharging the battery, it can also be uh, used just to run off of AC power. If you have a, an application where you need to run it for a particularly long time and you have access to AC power, you can leave it plugged in. Um, or potentially you could use a large USB battery pack to give yourself additional life uh, for uh, longer recording cycles. Uh, like I said in the, the form factor uh, slide, uh, that LED status indicator will also tell you what the device is doing while it's charging and, and indicate the charge status. Uh, the next thing about the device is how configurable it is. So we talked about a lot of different applications, a lot of ways that people can use these devices. And since the uh, users may be using the device so differently for different applications, we've made it adaptable and very configurable. So with the UltraShock, you've got six channels. You've got X, Y, and Z for your shock axes, and you've got temperature, pressure, and humidity. Now, not every application may require all six of those channels. So you can actually disable the channels that you're not going to use 
And unlike uh, some other models, this actually would allow that memory to be accessible for the other channels to give you a, a higher total memory capacity uh, for the, the channels that are being used or uh, a greater number of readings that can be recorded in any given recording session. We also allow for trigger settings. So I talked about multiple models being compressed down to one, and that's because now this device, in addition to doing peak or instantaneous, it can do trigger settings as well. So the trigger settings are user definable or user configurable, and you can set this by axes. So you can set it for one or all three axes. Uh, and you could, for example, set the logger to have a 5G threshold on the Z axis. So the logger will not actually begin recording until that 5G level is exceeded on the Z axis. When you configure the trigger settings, you can also choose how many readings are recorded each time the logger triggers. So this allows you to potentially use very fast reading intervals, but still uh, manage how much memory is being used for any given shock event. Um, or it allows you to just kind of uh, pair out the data that's not necessarily relevant for your application. Uh, as I mentioned before, the ranges are also configurable. So users can select which range makes the most sense before recording and they are not locked into a range at purchase like they would have been before. Uh, this is a very easy change to make, and with some applications, uh, users may run through the same test in different ranges to compare the results or to kind of hone in on what range makes most sense. Uh, the logger does support both peak and instantaneous recording modes. So with the peak mode, you can set your reading interval to be as fast as 256 hertz, but it will constantly be sampling at 512 hertz, so 512 times a second in the background, regardless of which reading interval you pick. So this means that for a, a long transportation application or shipping application, you could potentially set it to a slower reading interval, like once a minute or once every five minutes, and still catch those peak or those largest shock events that occur during that cycle. So that is very, very useful for long recording sessions where you're really only concerned with what is the most shock um, that my particular product or device under test experienced. The only downside with going with a slower reading interval is that you're only recording the one peak event for each axis that occurred in that interval. So if you do go as slow as something like five minutes, keep in mind that if two shock events were to happen in that five minutes, you'd be catching just the larger of the two. Uh, but for shipping, this may be appropriate. With instantaneous mode, you can go as fast as 1024 hertz, so 1024 times a second. Uh, but it will not be recording or sampling anything in between. So keep that in mind. With instantaneous, you're probably going to want to use one of these very fast reading intervals. You don't have to. You could pick once a minute with instantaneous, but you might miss quite a, little, quite a lot of information. So this mode is particularly useful for the very fast reading intervals. And this is also where you might consider using trigger settings uh, to ensure that you're managing the memory. Uh, but when it comes to memory, we do have a nice large capacity in this unit. Um, so if you have all channels enabled, all six channels, you're looking at 660,000 readings per channel or a total reading capacity of approximately 4 million. Uh, and if you were to record just a single channel, you could actually devote the entire memory to that channel. So any combination in between could be selected by the user. So we've already covered some of the key specifications and I don't want to bore you with, uh, with all the details here, but our specifications are available on the data sheets on our website um, and we do also put them in the user guides. And I'll just take a, a, a brief moment to touch on the Shock 300 as well. 
Like I said, this is basically for those users looking for a little lower cost model, uh, but it does have the same features and functionality for the key aspect of this logger, which is the shock. So we've got the same ranges, uh, same form factor. Really the only thing we are taking out with these units is temperature, humidity, and pressure to save a little bit of money for the users. And again, uh, these specifications would be available on the website. Okay, so now we have a great video that our marketing team set up uh, showing how you would configure the device in our software. With the included USB-C cable, Connect the Ultrashock to a PC running the free MagTech software. Now locate and select the Ultrashock within the Connected Devices menu. With the device selected, click Custom Start. When selecting a start method, you have the option to start logging now or schedule a specific date and time to begin logging with delayed start. The Ultrashock can either be stopped manually from the software or automatically scheduled to stop at a specific date and time. For this example, we will use the manual stop option. Now click Change Device Properties to open the Properties window. Under the General tab, you'll find a Range Selection drop-down menu. Select the gravity range you expect to be recording in. Under the Channels tab, you have the ability to enable or disable channels such as temperature, humidity, or pressure. You also have the ability to enable or disable certain shock axes if there is one particular axis of importance. If memory needs to be maximized, consider disabling channels that are less important for your application. Within the Calibration tab, take note of the last calibration date and determine if it's time to schedule your next tune-up. MatchTech recommends annual calibrations to ensure maximum accuracy. Under the Power tab, you can check on the current battery life and other device notifications. Lastly, we have the Trigger tab. Here, you can enable triggers for each axis. If the Ultrashock senses a reading above the user set threshold, the device will be triggered to begin recording data. When triggered, the logger will record the number of readings set in the Trigger Sample Count field at the specified reading interval. So if the Trigger Sample Count is set to 20, and the reading rate is set to 1 second, once the trigger threshold is breached, the device will then record 20 readings over the course of 20 seconds. It is important to keep the time frame of expected shock activity in mind when selecting these values, meaning if the vibrational data of your application will take approximately 6 seconds, depending on the application it may be wise to adjust your values so you're only capturing data for 10 or so seconds post-trigger. With the Fill Memory on First Trigger tick box checked, once triggered, the device will record data at the user-specified reading interval until memory is exhausted. When ready, click OK to apply the changes. Now select the rate at which the data logger will record each reading. Then select whether you'd like to record the shock data instantaneously, or record the data peaks. When set to instantaneous mode, the Ultrashock will simply sample data at the specified reading rate and may miss any spikes that occur between each recorded sample. With the shock recording mode set to peak, the device will record the greatest peak that occurred during the last reading interval. If the wraparound tick box is checked, once memory is filled, the device will continue to log by recording over the oldest data. If wraparound is left unchecked, the device will simply stop recording when memory is full. When ready, click Start to begin logging at the designated start time. Then mount the Ultrashock in the operating environment. Mounting the Ultrashock loosely or attaching it to a soft surface will dampen the shock and vibrational data the device receives. Therefore, the best practice is to securely mount the device to a solid surface to ensure readings are as precise as possible. When logging is complete, reconnect the Ultrashock to the PC. Select the logger in the connected devices list, then click the Stop button. Now click Download to offload the data to the software. The data can then be displayed in graph view, as a data table, or as summarized statistics.
right. So that video really highlights, you know, really highlights how easy it is to set up the UltraShock or Shock 300 or really any of our loggers in the software. And that brings me to kind of another key point about our, our loggers in general um, or using our products in general is the, the Magitech 4 software. Most of our loggers do use this software and it is adaptable for many users' needs. So it's simple to get set up, get your logger started, stopped, and downloaded. But it also includes a very robust set of tools for data analysis, so you can really get the most out of your data. Now, on this screen here, we're, we're looking at a few different types of reports that can be generated in the software. Now, this is just one example of a layout. The layout itself is also customizable. You can move these windows around and choose which ones you're viewing at any given time. Uh, for example, if you want to expand the graph to take up the whole screen um, or hide some of these panels to give yourself more room, it's very easy to do so. So on the, the, the left side or the, the largest section, we've got the graph showing all six channels and those channels are different colors by default. You can change the colors, you can zoom in, um, you can set value lines or time markers to very easily show where different stages of a process are happening, uh, or in the case of a shock application, you might put time markers to show when a product was moving from uh, one location to another or from one transportation vessel to another. We've also got uh, the statistics screen shown here with a few of the default statistics, minimum, maximum, standard deviation, average. But this is also something that the user can change to fit their needs as we have a variety of custom statistics that can be added to any of these reports. And then on the lower right hand side, we see uh, your standard data table report, which is just your raw numerical or tabular data. So again, the software is very easy to get into, very easy to use, but still robust enough to give you all of the, the data analysis that you need. Um, we also offer two versions of the software. So the standard software is available free to all users. It's on our website for download. In fact, we're uh, releasing a new version today. And we also have a secure package available. The secure package takes everything that you find in the standard software and adds additional security features on top. For example, user management, uh, digital signing and locking of reports, and an audit trail to keep track of uh, what users are doing within the software. One of the other cool things that was shown in that, uh, that video that wasn't highlighted was the actual log time of the device so when you're setting the parameters for reading interval, it'll actually show you how long in days, minutes, and seconds of the, how long that logger will actually log before the memory or battery is expired. So really, really cool feature that's you know pretty much unique to the, the Magitech uh, product. Yeah, that's a fantastic point, Ken. Um, the, the log time instantly tells you how long it's going to record when you change the reading interval. So you can select the one that makes the most sense for the, the time of the recording that's required. So for a competitor analysis, we have this screen intentionally left blank. Uh, there's a few shock vibration devices out there that are available, um, made by other manufacturers. And, you know, they each have their advantages. Some may have longer battery life, but less readings. Or some may have more readings, but less battery life. Some have software, some just download CSV data. We've got a pretty good uh, knowledge base of that competitive product. We just didn't want to put it out there uh, to, to you know, highlight or low light their product versus ours. If you have questions about a specific logger and how it compares to ours and what our selling features and benefits are, would be over and above those products, by all means, let us know. I'd be happy to put together a competitive analysis for you. So you'll actually understand why the, we feel the Magitech product is a much better product at a, at a very competitive price point for what you're getting feature and benefits wise. 
Absolutely. I mean, I think we keep an eye on uh, what the competition is doing and make sure that we're delivering a total package that's really right for our customers. I think the, the biggest competitive advantage we have over uh, other manufacturers is that Magitech 4 software. Uh, for a free piece of software, the things that that does is just amazing. Uh, other competitors, they may have software, but it's not uh, user friendly or it may just download straight CSV data into Excel. So again, that Magitech 4 software is uh, a deal breaker or a deal maker when you're uh, looking to sell this logger. Excellent. So it looks like we have had a couple of questions come in uh, from some of the viewers that are watching. Uh, Ken, I'll let you uh, take the first one there. All right, so uh, the question from Michelle, how do I choose the right range for my application? Well, as Tom had mentioned before, uh, this logger does come with three ranges that you select. And then it's completely up to you and your product on how you select this. We would recommend that you would start with the largest range, that 300G range, and then run some tests to see what your highest expected shock would be in the process. Uh, one thing to keep mind of is as you go lower uh, in that shock range down to the 15G accelerometer, the resolution and the accuracy does get much better. So if you're running uh, and you find that your highest shock that you're going to see is in that 20G range, you're going to want to select that 100G sensor. So you're going to want to be lower but not above. Uh, and you'll still get good accuracy and resolution. If your highest uh, G range that you're gonna see is say 12G, by all means, get into that 15G sensor because again, the resolution is very outstanding and that is the most accurate uh, choice that you can select when making that uh, decision. Absolutely. Um, so we also had a question from Eric uh, and he asked whether or not there are three sensors inside. So I want to expand on uh, something that I had mentioned earlier about uh, the multiple sets of sensors. So there are sets of sensors for the low G and high G ranges. Uh, so the low G would cover the 15 G range and the high G covers the 100 and 300 G ranges. Um, and we get X, Y, Z data uh, from both of these sets of sensors um, to, you know, basically give you the, the data that you need for that particular range. And our calibration process has also improved uh, dramatically when we created this new model. Uh, we have a new proprietary calibration system that allows us to do high G calibration for the first time uh, with the new model. Um, with our prior models, you know, we had great sensors that we had uh, good specified accuracy based on the sensor manufacturer's specifications, uh, but we were not able to do much in the way of calibration other than calibrating at 1G. Now we can actually do calibration at very high G levels as well to do a two point adjustment, and ensure that we have great accuracy uh, with both ranges, with both sets of sensors. So I've got an additional question for Tom. This does come up quite a bit um, and it wasn't asked here. So I'll uh, go ahead and ask that question. Uh, we talked earlier before about uh, monitoring orientation of a product, this end up or whatever, right. uh, or even the direction. Once you're analyzing the data, how can you tell which direction the impact came from? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, if we can just go back a few slides to one where we're looking at the, the front of one of these loggers. We have a nice little key on the front to show us the directionality. So as you can see to the left of where it says shock 300, we have a key that says X, Y, and Z. And there are arrows here. Uh, the Z direction in this case would be pointed towards the user, but you could imagine that if this was on a table and the shock 300 label was facing straight up, the Z direction would be straight up and the X direction would be left and right. Um, and the Y direction in this case is up and down, but if the label was facing up, it would be forward and back. And these are uh, 
these are directional in the sense that you will get a positive number if you are going to the right on the X scale, a negative number if you're going to the left. Uh, with Z, if it was facing up, then a positive number means, uh, you know, acceleration in that direction. A negative number means acceleration in the other direction. As far as orientation monitoring, basically, if we're looking at a, a device that's a, at a standstill, we are looking for 1G, for one Earth gravity. So in this case, with the orientation that we are looking at on this picture, we would expect 1G on the y-axis and zero Gs on the Z and X axes. If we were to tip this over, so the label is facing up towards the ceiling, now we would expect 1G on the Z axis in zero Gs on the Y and X axes. Um, so this allows you to very easily uh, tell orientation. Uh, and since we do go positive and negative, uh, if we flip it on its face, so the shock 300 label is facing towards the table or towards the floor, we would expect negative one on the Z axis and again, zero on the others. Uh, if you get something like uh, half a G on two axes, then you may have uh, the device tilted or uh, in a diagonal orientation of some sort. <clears throat> Excellent. And the other question that we get quite often uh, is how many G's does it take to damage my particular product? You want to uh, talk about that, Tom, a little bit? Sure. So uh, that is a, a question that potentially has a lot of variables involved. Uh, and I mean, that's really why we're selling the product so you can test to determine the answer to that question based on your product, based on the packaging that you're using or the transportation systems that you're using. Um, or based on any uh, protection that you're using, such as, uh, you know, shock absorption, things of that nature. Um, so it would be very difficult for us to specifically answer for any given product what it's going to take to damage that product. But our logger is perfect for you to find that answer uh, by doing your own uh, drop testing, fragility testing, um, or transportation, uh, transportation and packaging uh, evaluation to determine not only what the product is likely to see, but to determine what the failure tolerances might be. Yeah, that's exactly correct. Uh, one thing to remember, you know, speaking to that subject, is it's not always the, the peak acceleration that damages your product, but it's the actual duration of that shock and impact that damages your product. So you can have a very strong high G peak that does absolutely no damage, but you could have a lower G impact with a much wider duration that could do tremendous damage to your goods. So this is why testing your product with the aid of a shock logger is extremely important to understand what your uh, manufactured product can handle. Is there any other questions that anybody has out there? And if there isn't, um, we thank you guys very, very much for attending the webinar today. If you do have any questions that pop up, you know, you think about them later on today or tonight, by all means, zip us a question. Uh, the info at, sales at, or support at websites or email addresses. Um, will get to us and we will most certainly respond very quickly. And obviously the website, if you need more information is, uh, is there for literature and other marketing materials. So thank you once again. Excellent. Thank you all for joining us.